get you a Bible study sheet and a prayer sheet, and looks like it's going to be us for this evening, okay? I trust you've had a good day. Pray the Lord uh, allowed you to be prosperous in whatever you were doing. You know, it's one of the greatest gifts we get is life, isn't it? And then to be able to have some resemblance of continuity from one day to the next. One of those great blessings of the Lord. Let me get myself an ink pen before I get started here. Okay, let's look at the prayer sheet as we get started this evening. Ann Cox, uh, who was it? You shared with me last week, I think, about Miss Ann and Debbie had carried some cookies to them and was coming home with a, a little... Uh, report on that but anyway keep keep her in prayer uh am i right that it's something with her back now i believe she's that they've drawn a debbie came home telling me that so when i talked to her she said it hip, but she was going to make sure that it wasn't her back or anything okay the hip, and so at that time she didn't know for okay and i might be speaking out of turn but i think it is more so, more so yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm told now that it's pretty well got her incapacitated, can't do much. She was hurting that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ann Cox, Byron and Kay Bell, Carol Aldridge, Charles Bowen, David Hodges. Brother, when do you go back? Uh, October the 4th. October the 4th. Okay, keep our brother in prayer. Don Petrie. I shared with y'all, uh, I think, uh, last week that he was going through his week of treatment. So that's behind him. I don't know when his follow-up with his doctor is. Uh, Dorothy Melton, Elon Galloway, Florence Bowman, Francis Petty, Frank Henderson. I think I told y'all on Sunday that Brother Frank had spent some more days in the hospital. They were having to draw fluid off of him again. So keep him much in prayer and I apologize I have not called uh, there since the weekend and I should have followed up with that Glenna Lamp Herb and Brenda Diener got a nice note from uh, her this weekend and well Monday matter of fact so uh, they're they're doing as well but she's still uh, struggling with uh, some of her things J.O. Hennett Jack and Clary Stolte Jan McLean Jeremy Pittman Marlon, you want to say you want to give the church a thank you about that? Uh, praise the Lord. Yeah, we uh, got to see Jeremy for the first time in over a year. We were having a, a good visit, and the chaplain came in and uh, come over, and spoke to us, and he uh, took time to tell us what a blessing Jeremy is to the people over in the faith-based area that uh, he was serving God. Amen. 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 Madeline Joyner, Marilyn Griffiths, Naomi Bowen, Richard and Jackie Gillespie, Roger Shipman, and I was talking to Don back in the fellowship hall, and Brother Roger's going to have some, uh, uh, I don't know what the proper word would be, but anyway, he's got some veins in his uh, lower extremities. I don't know if it's both legs or one leg, but Anyway, they're going to work on them in Jacksonville, and I'm not sure of what day. He told me what day that's going to be, but it's coming up in the next week or so. Uh, they think that they can uh, work on that and help him out, okay? Roy Heaton, Sammy and Bonnie Gaskins. I did notice on Facebook that Bonnie said she had taken her last infusion, and I'm thinking that was from her, her infection that she was making note of that so she was she was tickled uh not having to to go back and uh go through that process sammy sweat uh anything new brother uh, improving somewhat no, okay just, uh, improving. improving little by little huh sammy williams uh so have, have we had sammy's name on there or is that new don't That's ring new. a bell there That's new. new okay i thought it was uh, that's that's our Sammy Williams. Uh, Stephen Stokes, uh, I've not read anything new on Facebook today. Stephen uh, is still in Savannah. Uh, I think that they put a trach in him. He had made some advancements, and uh, 
that's part of a process that they can wean them off the vent much quicker. So it was seemingly positive, the last that I was reading from his wife. Terry Meeks, I've not heard anything today. I should have asked Daniel. Daniel's sort of my, he's sort of my ears uh, there because he hears things that I don't. Anybody heard anything? Jim, have you heard anything? Okay, keep Terry in your prayer. Tina Henderson, uh, if you follow Tina on Facebook, she she is uh, getting ready to, a matter of fact, she may be in Augusta right now for a couple of days. But anyway, it's coming nearer her time uh, to get the stem cells, and her dad is going to be the donor. Uh, so that makes him have to go up. I think this is going to happen in October, if I'm correct on that. But keep praying for them. Tommy and Margie Hodges, Torrance Hayes. Brother Torrance has had COVID. I think he stayed home. One of our members texted me yesterday wanting to carry him lunch, and uh, I asked her today, did she do it? And she said, yes, so that worked out. Don't know anything new on Torrance, though. Uh, it's a miracle for him to stay home a week. So I'm supposing he still is. Hadn't saw him on the street, have you, brother? We could call a couple of spots and verify he's been home. That'd be down to wings, bait, and tackle. And Torrance goes by thinking he cares out the trash at Ed's package store. If you ever see Torrance there, he's not in there for the spirits. That's just some of his friends. So uh, Torrance, Torrance likes to tell me, and I, I, I love him. He always tells me, now, I got friends. I got friends. So uh, that's part of his friends there. Good old Torrance. Wayne Haddock, I don't have anything new to give you there. Uh, Wayne's improving, thank the Lord. Whit Dixon, I actually got to talk to Mr. Whit today. Uh, Maddie, his friend, called me this morning and said, Hey, I hadn't called you because I didn't know anything new, but if you'll call Whit right now, he's got his phone close to him, and I did. Mr. Whit is to get out on Saturday, I think is what he told me. He gets out on Saturday. Uh, and it's conditional. That means he's got to walk out, he said. They're not going to roll him out. But he's, he's improved his walking with his therapy. So, hey, praise the Lord. He sounded stronger, thanking the Lord that uh, he's getting to get that behind him, hopefully, soon, okay? Y'all got anybody else, church family? David, you got some copies back there? Alicia, right there, if you'll help her out, okay? Anybody else, church family? Okay, we good there? Well, let's just take time here and pray for the family. We've got some, we definitely see God at work in these ways, and we praise Him for that, okay? One of you, one of you volunteer to pray for us here? Anybody? David Martin, do it for us, brother. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, on the friend section, and then I'm going to give you time to, to give me some things and some updates, okay? Uh, Wanda Strickland, that's Stan Strickland's mother. She's at Baptist Village. We want to keep praying for her, okay? And Stan, is, uh, he, he and his wife are the caregivers for Miss Wanda. Also, uh, Dana Parker and their family, they sort of in that holding pattern waiting to get their new son, okay? David, is there anything new on that? They still waiting? Okay. Okay, and that's Dana Stewart and her family. Dana Parker, you know her. Uh, okay, we keep them in prayer. Uh, talk to Jim Steedley today. He called me uh, middle of the afternoon and told me, uh, gave me, gave me the update on on Kevin, and 
He said there has been some improvement there. Uh, they have put in a trach, and I'm sure that was days ago, but uh, they had moved him to a more of a PCU or a PICU room. Uh, so that that was real positive, and uh, Jim Jim just wanted me to have the new version of that, and I appreciated that he would call and uh, give me that update. So he said he's not out of the woods by a long shot, but he at least is is making some improvement, and even even after hospitalization, it's just going to be a long long uh, healing process. So keep all of that family in your prayer, okay, uh, as well as friends of theirs. Anybody else? Now, y'all give me some updates or new people if we need to today. David? I went into uh, Brother Norman's battery, and uh, he's recovering from uh, a blockage he had. Okay. Okay. Uh, Terry Larrisy gave us that name a few weeks ago, I think. Thank you for the update there on Larry Norman. Anybody else? Uh, as as we talk about it from time to time, uh, we pull a few names off of there simply for space-wise, but always very much willing to put them back if we might pull somebody off that, that definitely needs our prayer. No, they they live out in Jamestown. Uh, Belinda Belinda keeps us updated on them. Jerry was a pastor or is a pastor, retired. Jerry's last church was Nichols Baptist Church or First Baptist Nichols, I'm not sure. But Patsy, I, I, I would say what I remember, but I might be off guard on that. But Patsy has... Uh, has has an ongoing issue. It's a disease. I can't remember exactly which one, but but Jerry is a caregiver to her. So they attend the Jamestown Baptist Church. Anybody else? Okay, military. We keep saying we don't have anything new or any addresses, but we we have to keep working on that. Ministries, Awana, Call to Care, Deacon Widow, Widower, uh, Kingdom Care, Outreach, Contacts, and, you know, sometimes I was, I'm convicted. Sometimes we talk about what we can't do because of COVID, but we can still talk, okay? And uh, let's be faithful to that with, with our in-reach as well as our outreach, if you know where I'm going with that one, okay? On the back, the shut-ins. Sent Brother Tom Allen a card last week, so we ought to be getting a response from him in a week or two. And once we do, we'll try to read that to you, okay? Gilbert Altman, Vidal Bennett, uh, Marsha Bishop, Florence Bowman, uh, Betty Christmas, Roy Eli, Janie Gibson, Stacy Hobbs, Gloria Holland, Betty Hires, Jackie Pearson, and Miss Jackie Sermons, okay? Any anything y'all want to report to us on any of these? Even though it might might not be what you'd consider significant, but it all is because if we ever get a word on any of them, other people don't know how they do it and might want to ask us from time to time. You know, people that never got to know Tom Allen very well just really missed the Amen. Amen. <coughs> Brother Tom Allen was a is a retired Methodist minister, and he's a retired Southern Baptist minister. And when they moved to Baptist Village, I think they might have been about one of the first people that moved in one of the homes they built out there. And he and his wife joined Second Baptist Church. And uh, if I'm not bad mistaken, I believe it was Harold Land that invited them to Second Baptist Church. And if you ever knew Brother Harold, you can greatly appreciate him because he was a he was a voice for Jesus and uh, that that little reminder of Tom and Barbara Allen and uh, Miss Barbara's going to be with the Lord but Mr. Tom's in Virginia because he has kids there or a kid there yeah, and uh, he, uh, he told me the last time I visited him out there he said you take these and you read it 
Amen. Amen. We, we love Brother Tom. Anybody else? Anything else? The missionaries, you see the list. Keep praying over them. Uh, Debbie had made a contact with the Weldons. They're coming back, when did you say? June of 2022. Okay. Uh, so keep them much in your prayer. What now? Now we're in 21, so it'd be next year, 22. <laughs> hey, add Debbie's, sis add Debbie's sister to friends, Teresa. Uh, Teresa has had some major surgery last week and uh, definitely, definitely needs your prayer. She's trying to learn uh, some new things with some surgery that she had to have. Name is Teresa Reese, and uh, she'll definitely appreciate your prayers. Her husband will as well. Anybody else? Anything else? You want to pray for us? Somebody volunteer? Anyone? Okay, Jim. Thank you, brother. Amen. Thank you, brother. Anybody got a praise? Praise? Before we move on? Okay. Uh, my privilege to go to lunch today with a with an older young pastor. He's uh, he's 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 older in the sense that he's about my age, but he's a new pastor in the sense that he's only been ordained for a couple of months, and uh, he had texted me wanting to go to lunch. So it was my my challenge and my blessing to go with him today. So uh, I don't mind telling you it was Steve Hampton. So Steve's. Uh, loving, loving, serving, and he's over at uh, New Hope is where Steve is. New Hope used to be New Hope Advent, and now it's New Hope Fellowship. And uh, you, you pray for them over there as he, uh, as they work together. Okay, and he was very, he was very much commending the the fellowship over there. So praise the Lord. Anything else before we move on? been looking at the power of one, okay, and I'm not going to rehearse the titles that we've used, the people that we have uh, reviewed and viewed. If I remember correctly, though, I can say this, uh, I think, uh, with all sincerity, I think we've only looked at one negative uh, person, and when I say negative, uh, that, that was negative, that he... I had a terrible influence on a on an individual, and if you know anything or have learned anything through your life, uh, and that is one of the cautions our parents would always give us, and they would always tell us, "Now watch who you hang around with." Okay, and they had a lot of different ways of saying that. If you if you hang around with the dogs, what you gonna get on you? You know, it's amazing how they could just try to drive something home with that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, we've looked at one case where there was a negative influence. Now, there are many, many more in Scripture. But again, today, I, I was asking the Lord over the last couple of days to, to uh, give, give me another positive influence of one person. Uh, and he directed my attention to Acts chapter 9, and it's Ananias, okay? Now, remember, if I remember correctly from my study the last couple of days, 
there are about three Ananiases mentioned in Scripture. Now, one of these uh, uh, was in Acts chapter 5. Now, you know this can't be that Ananias because uh, that one lied to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, and he faced a quick death, okay? Matter of fact, the Spirit confronted him one morning, and then, as tradition would hold it, he died and was buried before sunset. So with that in mind, we know that's not the Ananias we talk about. However, at the conversion of Saul, what we find is uh, another Ananias, and this is the one that we're writing or that we're studying this evening. Now, I, I recorded uh, all of the verses there. You could read it uh, in its entirety, but I'm going to choose to read it uh, section by section as we work through it a little bit, okay? And with that, the positive influence of, of this guy upon the life of the new convert, uh, Saul of Tarsus, we call him, whose name was changed to Paul. With all of that in mind, this is the Ananias. Let's read together. Look in uh, uh, your notes there, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and he, or, or not he, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive uh, his sight. Now remember, Paul, Saul, let me say, as he uh, was first known, Paul, as I'll probably make mention of him for the rest of the evening, Paul would share his testimony on other occasions. Uh, and in those other occasions, you'll find one of them is in Acts chapter 22, what you'll discover is uh, that there are not inconsistencies uh, with what he says, uh, although they might not be, they may not be totally word by word verbatim, okay? Well, uh, this is uh, the conversion experience of Saul. And as we look at verses 10 to 12, uh, we want to pull out uh, Ananias and look at him rather than looking at uh, Saul or Paul, okay? First thing we see about Ananias, or the first thing I see, is that he is a follower. Now, when I say follower, you definitely know I'm talking about a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, it says it this way, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Well, the first thing we know about disciples are their followers, are they not? Matter of fact, the Lord Jesus, when he would begin to call out those, and when I say those, I'm talking about the twelve, if you remember correctly. Uh, Jesus had many more disciples than the twelve, uh, and uh, they we just commonly refer to the twelve as his disciples. Well, he first called them to be followers, you remember? He said, follow me and I'll make you to become what? Fishers of men. But their first their first uh, uh, obligation to the Lord Jesus was to be a follower. Well, uh, I think we can learn real quickly there that Ananias first was a follower. Now, the Lord is speaking to him in a vision, uh, and he calls out Ananias. Uh, so I'm, I'm learning from this, as you are that not only is Ananias a follower, but he also is a learner. Now, uh, Matthew 11, if you remember 28 to 30, the Lord said, uh, uh, He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. What we learn from that discipling mentality is, that a disciple is first a follower, secondly, a learner. Jesus pulled these 12 aside, and he didn't just simply want to teach them to be fishers of men, but he, uh, he was developing 
those guys that were going to become uh, the leaders in the church or the early church uh, as he had ascended after his crucifixion. So it is very important for us to see that a disciple is first and important there that they become a learner. Now, at the moment we, we, we cease to learn, uh, men have said it in uh, many different ways, but when we cease to learn, uh, we almost have become invaluable uh, for the task that is ahead of us. So I learned that he's a follower, a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, said to him, Lord, uh, there in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. So the roll call, okay, I'm here, Lord. What, what, is, uh, what is new for us today? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, uh, he prayeth. Now, again, Ananias, a follower, Ananias, a learner. And at the point that I'm looking here, Ananias is a listener, is he not? You know what? It's one of the, I think it's a gift of God to learn to listen. Now, I find myself and, and I catch myself the longer I live when I'm, when I'm listening to someone who has questioned me about something or who has called me about something. The first thing I kick myself about is when I easily, if I'm not careful, begin to interrupt them with an answer or my position on something when I should just be sitting there listening. So we see here Ananias, a follower, a learner, a listener. But what we also discover here is that Ananias is a leader. And from that, uh, we can see that all through the rest of the text, okay? M namely, verse 12 said, he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now, uh, the Lord is giving Ananias a lot of information, is he not, about what he's going to be confronted with, or might I say who he's going to be confronted with, once he gets there uh, to the place of meeting. The paragraph below, which in essence is two paragraphs, I, I put them together, but what you have there is John Gill's notes on verse 12. And in chapter 22 of Acts, what happens there is there's a little maybe different uh, presentation of Ananias. When in Acts twenty two twelve it said, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law. And it says also that he having a good report of all the Jews that dwelt there. Acts 9 and 10 would give us. So when you, when you stop and you see these, well, Acts twenty two twelve. 12. When you stop and you see these two things about Ananias that's not described in Acts chapter Nine, what we get is a, a clearer view, I believe, of uh, Ananias, the man that he is. Now, read the paragraphs, if you will. Uh, I'm just going to turn my page because I have two pages, and I'm going to move on. But that gives you something to follow through uh, there in your Bible study. Ananias is a disciple. How do I know that? The Scripture tells me he is. Secondly, Ananias is a discerner. Now, verse 13 and verse 14 said, Ananias says to the Lord now, Hey, God, remember this, God loves conversation. Right? Aren't you glad that he doesn't zap us when we ask him a question? Aren't you glad that he don't even mind if we ask him something two or three different times? Look at what Ananias does. It says there in verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Now, I'm saying, and I'm trying to present Ananias tonight as one 
who made a great difference in another person's life. Now, Ananias wants the Lord to know full well now that he has a little bit of information about this guy that he's sending him to. Now, you and I can chuckle about that a little bit because we know the Lord's the omniscient one. That means he knows everything. Matter of fact, someone said that he doesn't know anything or he doesn't think about anything that he hasn't thought of before. He knows it all. But now we find Ananias not really questioning the Lord. But as I would say in the South, he really wants the Lord to get his two cents worth about this thing. Now, Lord, you're asking me to go to this place to meet this man. He said, Lord, let me tell you a couple of things I know about him. He said, I know of Saul's evil. Verse 13. Not only do I know about Saul's evil, he said, I know about his assignment. Which in verse 14 it says, He's got authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. Now you and I know when we read Saul's conversion experience that all of that is explained fully well, is it not? But Ananias, the good godly man that he is, just for his own sake, I think, Reminds the Lord, now Lord, you're giving me this assignment. So I think that it proves to me that he's a discerner. Why would I say he's a discerner? Because he knows that God is not going to give him an assignment that's too big for him. You know something, that's true of all of us, isn't it? God will not ask us to do something that he hasn't equipped us for. Someone says that God calls the equipped, but I rather believe He equips the called. Amen. And the reason being said of that, if He didn't equip the called, most of us would never be preaching over, over the first sermon. Why? Because that was probably our shortest and the most miserable time we might remember. But hey, God... God is a faithful God, and therefore Ananias is a discerner. Third, Ananias is a doer. Now, have you, have you ever met anyone, or have we been the one that would like to talk the good talk? We could talk about the old times or the good days, but now what I see here about Ananias is he won't just talk about it, Verse 15 said, yes, Ananias, I hear your appeal. He didn't say that. That's my paraphrase. Verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and all the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then that first phrase of verse 17 and Ananias went his way. Isn't it amazing? Is it that Ananias got to speak his heart to the Lord about who Saul is? Or is it the Lord affirming to Saul or affirming to Ananias again that uh, he's giving him information more about Saul and amazingly, Ananias shows us a, the character of himself as he demonstrates himself as a doer, not a hearer only. Now, verse uh, 15, again, that first phrase, but the Lord said unto him. Now, he listened faithfully. You know, he did mention to the Lord who Ananias was, but I don't find any more rebuttal through the entire text that we're reading tonight. So, I'm saying he listened faithfully. He learned favorably. I put out there in the notes beside of that. The Lord said it and that just sort of settled it, did it? You know, Ananias, I think, just turns around and heads, heads to... Heads to the place there uh, to find Saul there at the house. If you remember, does it uh, not say the house of Judas, if I remember reading that correctly? He said, go thy way. He's a chosen vessel unto me. 
And then, I didn't finish my outline, but I said he left. And verse 17 said he went his way. I would have been even impressed if that his there would have been capitalized. Because at this moment, his way was God's way, was it? He just was faithful. Now, Ananias is a disciple. Ananias is a discerner. Ananias is a doer. And last, I find there that An and then Ananias is a discipler. Here is his first meeting with this fella who has been a murderer. You say, well, did he kill anybody? Well, he sort of let them throw their coats at his feet when Stephen was stoned. He, he's guilty there of participation, even though he might not have thrown a rock. But yes, we find now that uh, he meets him for the first time. Verse 17 uh, tells us there, And Ananias went his way, entered the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, is it amazing to you that he's saying brother? Why is he saying brother here? I don't know the full answer. Is he saying brother because he's speaking to a Jew? Is he saying brother because with the information the Lord has given him that he realizes now they're both on the same team? Amen. Probably because in verse 15 it says, For he is a chosen vessel. Amen. For me. Amen. So when we see that brother, it has more meaning than just, hey, we're fellow Jews, we're fellow believers. Now, uh, with that in mind, he is a discipler. So now Ananias, whether he has had this role before or not, I'm not sure. But with Saul, who was uh, one of the, quote, notable criminals of the day, who was thinking, and all along Saul, Saul thought he was doing God a favor. He was such a deeply religious fellow, he really thought Jesus was... Uh, was not the second person in the Godhead. He thought that Jesus was in the way. And as a result of that, the Lord had to deal with him. So when we see Ananias as a discipler, I, I put four things here. First of all, I reminded myself, not necessarily just you, but myself, about his apprehension of Saul. Secondly, about his acceptance of Saul. I find that as he went his way. He also has an announcement to Saul when he says there in the latter part of verse 17, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, if you went back to the conversion experience, yes, Saul and the Lord had a little conversation there that day as uh, he was blinded on the road to Damascus. But now we're discovering that Ananias comes possibly with some information that Saul hasn't had time to uh, hear or anything because now he's not only going to get his sight back, but now uh, Ananias said to Saul, you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, with that, that is a vital statement, I think, to, to, the, uh, to the person of Saul, very vital to uh, the work that Saul's going to be called to do. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a powerful statement for us to all hold on to, and that is that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Now, the old... Revival preacher said he was preaching a revival one day and the lady came to the altar and she was, uh, she was crying out every night of the revival, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me. And finally the old preacher or the pastor said to the revivalist, hey, don't pay attention to her. She does that all the time, but she leaks. Get filled with the Holy Spirit, she leaks. She has to be filled all the time, Well. Some of us resemble that. I leak too. Do you? Amen. Being filled with the Holy Ghost, he's referring to a, an instantaneous thing. See, when we got saved, we became, we became 
possessed. The Spirit of God took up residence in us. And praise the Lord, He didn't give us just a little bit of Him. He gave us all that we'd ever need of Him. But now, from that moment on, most of us have been given Him more of us for the simple sake that, hey, when we can get out of the way, God can do big things through us. So now we see the announcement to Saul, and then verses 18 and 19, I see his advancement of Saul. It says, There fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Now, there are many people who believe that there is a parenthesis here that we don't have a clearer understanding. In other words, if you study it chronologically, they're saying that right in here somewhere is where Saul will then go into Arabia for a couple of years or more. And that's when he would have his experience with the Lord. When he would go to, I call it, the place of higher learning, the Lord would be his teacher. And then it says, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Now, I would say from experience that Saul immediately at conversion, with the knowledge that he had of Scripture, could have immediately preached Christ in the synagogue. I also understand that there was that interim period where he went to Arabia, he makes mention of. And there he was schooled in the things of Jesus that uh, he had been taught were contrary to the things of the Lord. So whether he preached it instantly, or if you want to say he preached it 30 years later, I just tell you this, he was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he could have instantly preached it. If he did it later, that's all right as well. The simple statement is, though, once God takes up his dwelling place in us, he then equips us to do what he has called us for. So, if you've ever had an assignment from the Lord and you're still running from it, surrender. Because God equips the called. That means that he won't ask you to do something that he's not given you the grace and the power and the intellect to be able to do it. These six things on the bottom here are not original with me, and I should have put my source, but I have forgotten it. So just put copied there because this writer talked about uh, Ananias, and he said the man whom God uses is a part of the body of Christ. It's not written just totally about Ananias, but just think on these things, okay, and uh, come back and ask me about them later. The people who God uses is a part of the body of Christ. Usually they're saved. Now, it don't mean God can't use other people, but in this capacity, it was definitely a saved man that was doing the discipling. The man whom God uses may be very ordinary and sometimes an unlikely person. We can see that in all of the ones that we've studied over the last two months, can't we? Some of them might not have been people we would have chosen. But I'm glad God sees from the heart. You remember when he talked about David. The man whom God uses has a devout, consistent Christian life. We study in 1 John in our Sunday school uh, quarterly, you know, that we're using. And as we study 1 John, wow, you see the kind of people God uses. There's a fourth thing. The man whom God uses must be available to the Lord. Five, the man whom God uses must be full of tender affection and love. And then last, the man whom God uses must be well informed. And I gathered that from Ananias listening to God as well as uh, knowing what little he knew from the crowd or the local newspaper. He was still willing to listen to God about what God said about Saul. And it was very encouraging when he said, I've already given him an assignment or you'll be giving it for me. He'll be an, 
apostle to the Gentiles, a preacher to the Gentiles. Where would, uh, where would Saul have been without Ananias? Well, we know God would have just sent another one, wouldn't he? But how, how important was Ananias to Saul in his experience? It was the mouth of God for this moment, was he not? And you know, you and I never really realize the impact that we might have on somebody else's life. Hey, thank God for the moments, though. Anybody have a thought here? A word? Mm -hmm. I guess, did you use the word participation? No, uh, I, I said basically he, he was uh, guilty by, by just being there, you know. But he was the guarder of the coats there. Or, two words that I think of and I, over the years, and I'm not careful, I'll find myself being one that's uh, participating, and that's, that's all right. But I would rather be a child of God by association. Oh, yeah. Amen. That's good. Very good. Anyone else? I'm sure I, there's a lot more here than I've put into it. I just, I just, Ananias is one of those guys there for the God moment. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for all the events of this afternoon. There have been many people who have played a part. In what we're doing here in the Lord's house, thank you for those who have helped in preparing the meal. Those who were called, uh, seemed like at the last moment, to help serve it. Then those of us who are participating in the presentation, like those Awana workers, listeners. Uh, those who are involved now in the music uh, ministry. I, I thank you, Lord, that you have something that we can all be involved in in your work. Bless us. Give us rest for our bodies tonight as we go home and help us to wake into a new day being willing to make a difference in kingdom work. In Jesus' name, amen.